Hello, everybody. This is Brian from Necronomicast. Thank you for tuning in for this exciting 13th season of the show. Couldn't do it without you. Now, if you're ever wondering if there was a, a kind of a fun and inexpensive way that you could support the production of the show, I've got news for you. You can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Necronomicast. Every time I have an author on the show, I've purchased their book. Whenever a documentary filmmaker or a creative person is on the show to talk about their project, you know I've supported their project. So if you go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Necronomicast, that will enable me to continue to do the work that I do here on the show. So I thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart for all of the support and encouragement you've given me over the years. And uh, you know what? If you buy me a cup of coffee at the website, I would be more than happy to deliver a personalized message to you on the show. Two or more cups of coffee, you're going to get something in the mail. Buymeacoffee.com forward slash Necronomicast. And now, on with the show. From Omaha, Nebraska, the capital city of the historic haunted heartland, my name is Brian Corey, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all, young and old, to this special episode of the world-famous Necronomicast. When journalist Danny Casolaro was found dead in a hotel bathtub, police ruled it a suicide, but his family and colleagues believe he may have been murdered for investigating a conspiracy he called the Octopus, a hidden organization connected to stolen government spyware, a string of unsolved murders, and some of the biggest political scandals of the 20th century. Join me as I welcome researcher Christian Hansen and director Zachary Trites as they tell me all about their brand new Netflix special, American Conspiracy, The Octopus Murders. And now calling in on the Newsmaker Hotline, I'm so excited to be welcoming to the Necronomicast, Zachary Trites, the director, and Christian Hansen, the executive producer, photojournalist, and uh, kind of the subject uh, of sorts of the brand new Netflix documentary, American Conspiracy, The Octopus Murders. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Uh, I was very fortunate uh, to watch your new documentary, Four Parts, on uh, Netflix this week, and I got to hand it to you. It's, it's shocking. It's incredible. It's riveting, captivating. And uh, to have both of you gentlemen on my show to talk about and give us a little bit of insight into the case itself and uh, what went into making it, it's a real treat, a real pleasure to have you on. It's great to be here, Brian. I uh, really appreciate it. That's a, that's a nice introduction. Always nice to have that rather than the opposite. <laughs> well, I, no, I mean, I, I'm not blowing smoke here. Horrible. It was boring. I didn't understand a word of it. And so I still decided to have you guys on. No, no, no. Yeah. I have to tell you, though, it was it was captivating. I mean, I really get into these conspiracy theories, not because I subscribe or believe in every single thing that I see, but the way that you guys laid out this case. And I remember, you know, reading and hearing about it, like when I was in you know college, hearing about the um, the apparent or the alleged suicide of Danny Casolaro, the journalist who is kind of the uh, main subject of this as he investigates the unfolding of this, of this long reaching, long standing conspiracy theory. I remember reading and hearing about it, um, but I've never seen it portrayed on screen in such a way. And I know you guys must have spent so many years putting this together. Can you give me a little bit of insight? Like, you know, Christian, like it shows you as this happy, carefree young guy, like in 2013, you know, starting to put this together. And now here we are in 2024 and it's coming out. Like, can you talk about like the, the journey of bringing this out? Yeah, it started out as a, as a book project. Um, and I was totally on my own and I'd never written a book before. And I decided to write my first book about the most complicated case ever in the history of America. So, um, you know, at, at various points, I got um, waylaid with the putting it together part of it, but I never got waylaid with the accumulating vast amounts of information part of it. And, and I was so I was just continuing to read and study. And then at a certain point, um, I was able to get 
um, join up with my best friend, Zach, who's a brilliant um, director and he's always been my sounding board. So he, when he was finally ready to take this on, he knew like he was able to just jump right in. And, and basically our first project was picking up Michael Rakanashuto from prison. And we've just been like jumped on a thoroughbred horse from there. And we've just been riding around, uh, you know, it's been crazy. It's been a wild ride. What about the case like really got you like interested? Cause we're talking about this, uh, you know, like I said, the alleged, uh, suicide of, of Danny Casolero as he was investigating this case. And, you know, he was found in a hotel room on August 10th, 1991 in Martinsburg, West Virginia, uh, an apparent suicide, but just, you know, and, and trigger warning for people that, you know, have difficulty with the subject matter, but from all accounts, it was very sketchy. Uh, just the timing of it, also the condition of how he was found, uh, the, the, Self-inflicted wounds did not yeah. seem to be self-inflicted. I mean, and I'm no stranger to conspiracy theories or these kinds of things uh, in government. Um, <laughs> these things that blow up with the government. I mean, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, the land of the, the Franklin Credit Union. Yeah. So, yeah. So <laughs> these aren't strange things to me. But how did you decide to make this like, you know, like dedicate so much of your life to it? I mean, it happened um, sort of, uh, I mean... It, Really, and it, it it's I have a fear of my own blood. Uh, mm. I I mean I I don't like blood. I I can't. I I don't mean just to say my own blood. If someone's shooting up in a movie, if someone's bleeding, uh, it just it makes me very uncomfortable. And um, by all accounts, Danny had this same fear of needles and blood, and he wouldn't get blood work. He had to like be uh, kicking and screaming to get any sort of. Um, shots or blood work done by the doctor. And I, I know exactly how he feels. I've passed out just getting some uh, blood drawn at the hospital. And, you know, the way he died is like the bloodiest possible way. And um, that was an initial thing that kind of I where I related to him and thought like, well, that's bizarre. Why would he kill himself like that if if he's if he's so scared of of blood? And then from there, you know, I just continued um, looking into the case and finding other um, things that were sort of relatable um, to him and, and, and to me, like per personality wise. And, um, you know, I wanted to know more about what he was investigating as well as figuring out what happened to him because they're both quite confusing. Um, and this is so far reaching, like it starts off with uh, what he was investigating and we're talking about this promise software this is a, a, by inslaw it's an american software company um it takes this software and it's really like the birth of digital surveillance and earlier you mentioned this michael reconoshuto is that how you pronounce his name yes yeah reconoshuto yes this childhood genius this uh this this uh, eccentric character this childhood genius who is allegedly hired by the government to, to take this uh, stolen software that's stolen by the Justice Department. They lose a lawsuit, which is dismissed later. You know, it, it starts off with this, this birth of digital surveillance and how the government uh, is trying to spy on other countries uh, through these backdoor means uh, in the like the dawn of the computer age. Uh, and it's it just explodes from there. And, and You can't and you, make this up. You can't make it up. And I, it's, it's like... It takes, I don't know how, Zach, like you took all this information and these decades and, and of, of everything that's involved in this timeline and whittled it down to four one-hour episodes. I mean, there's so much there. I mean, a credit to you. I mean, you just have this riveting story that just continues with, with the kind of cliffhanger endings at the end of each episode and how you like put this together. And there must be so much collaboration between you two. Yeah. I mean, you know, Christian and I, first off, grew up together in Kentucky and Louisville. So we've known each other for a long time. And I don't think that anyone else could have kind of put this thing as it is together because it's so complicated, so difficult, um, so intricate and involves so much time. Right. So it was important to do this with somebody who you enjoy spending time with because otherwise it would be miserable. Um, and so, you know, and we, we've had a knowing him for so long, you know, we've, we've been through many ebbs and flows of our relationship and we're like, you know, 
for brothers for without a you know for lack of a better word so there's there's a very close familial bond there that can get us through i think maybe christian would agree uh some pretty dark days of trying to put this thing together um but in the end i mean you know it was an adventure and so that you know i think that's what we wanted to capture i think reading danny's own writings and and seeing how christian was interpreting those it was an adventure for him for the last year of his life and we wanted to capture that feeling and that energy uh it just happens to be a very dense story so we um we we did the work so other people don't have to i guess <laughs> for sure I mean, you guys are tackling subjects here about the FBI, the CIA, the National Security Agency. We're talking about the the upper most secret echelons of American government with some of the most powerful people in the American government, actually in the world, uh, with these covert operations. We're talking the drug running. We're talking about the Iran-Contra affair, the Shah of Iran, the October surprise with the Reagan election. I mean, no stone is left unturned in all this. And, and how... I mean, honestly, like you're putting this together for wide, huge worldwide distribution on, on the biggest streaming platform in the world. How scared? I mean, you must have been at a point so frightened for your own safety. I mean, Christian. Can I, now, can I tell you a, yeah, a, a story? Yeah. Okay. And this is okay. About, about a month and a half ago. Um, you know, I, I, I live in a studio apartment in Manhattan and I, and we were deep into this project. I'm not having friends over. No one's coming over to my house at all. It's just, I'm, I'm barely even there. I'm mostly at the office at this point in the story. And I have six pillows on my bed cause I will prop myself up and watch movies or whatever occasionally and, or read. And now I have five and I've looked everywhere for the six pillow. It has it vaporized it's disappeared and you know i have no way of explaining what happened to it other than like okay i don't have any way of explaining what happened to it but i you know i'm paranoid obviously like like you were saying and i'm like maybe somebody came into my room to uh send a message of some kind like look i could take your pillow i could take your life you know what i'm saying i don't know you know but the, here i am with five pillows talking to you i got and i don't know what happened did you count? Did you count them today before we started? Yeah, I did. I made my bed. There they were. I hope I'm not in any danger of talking to you, but I mean, I've seen it before. <sighs> Most people in America have seen it, and uh, I don't know. I don't know. Pretty crazy. Uh, Is that a threat, Brian? Is that somebody <laughs> tell you to, to give us a warning? I mean, I think that there's there's definitely a paranoia that goes along with telling any story that seems like it's been hidden or shouldn't be told, and dealing with people who are ostensibly some of the people we mentioned are criminals and dangerous. Um, I think that we have two good things going for us. One is that a lot of time has passed since many of the crimes that we discuss and, and several people have, have passed away. Um, and, um, you know, I think, you know, we just hope that everybody just accepts that this is out there and moves on. Sure. Now, Christian, What's really interesting, and, and Zach, too, you guys have taken this story, and it's about Danny Casolaro and how he's obsessed with this case. And you show, like, how he's gone from, like, this, um, this good-natured, super easy, happy-go-lucky kind of guy and how this case has kind of consumed him. And how, you know, he, his, his family members talk about how at family gatherings, he would just start talking about it nonstop and they would have to change the subject and how it totally consumed his life and how he kept getting deeper and deeper. And there's, it's really interesting how you framed it. Like with you, Christian, as you started investigating this case, how much of it's consumed your life and, and, and even going, what's neat about this duality, it's like you even remind people of how, how Denny looks like you guys have kind of same kind of features and you in reenactments take Denny's uh, role in, in all this. And so you, you've kind of got your own, you're kind of the subject matter. You're also reporting uh, on Danny. Danny's the subject matter. It's, it's interesting duality, how you guys framed, framed this, right? Like two generations of investigations uh, by two different investigators uh, and, and how remarkable it is. 
um, Danny went to say, went to finally meet Michael in person when he got arrested in 1991. And then 30 years later, when he got let out, me and Zach picked him up from <laughs> prison. And right. uh, there's a lot of me investigating in the story, but I w- want to point out that like two weeks before the deadline, Zach is on the phone every single day with confidential sources that I can't talk about, you know, tr- trying to like unlock more, but you know, Zach got super, super into it too. Like, um, <laughs> but you know, um, yeah, I can't remember what else you said. Well, I was also saying, I was also thinking about, oh, oh, I know what I wanted to say. So, okay. A big part of this, when it wasn't initially an idea that I would portray Danny Casolaro, um, I was I was open to it and I was actually excited about it um, because, you know, at, at a certain point, there's only so much data about what happened to him. And uh, and, you know, at a certain point, you're. He knew what happened, he knows what happened to him. So if I could get inside his head. Right. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm 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 in um, his, his office is is recreated. I'm driving his car, you know, his the office that that we made as the set looks exactly like the one he had. We have the exact same typewriter that he had. I'm driving his same car. And then we're recreating these meetings with Rob Booth Nichols. And and it really was a way of kind of that I wasn't expecting, but I was hoping would, you know, be rev- revelatory about you know, what Danny's final days were like to me as an investigator. It was a kind of an amazing investigative opportunity to role play as the subject of the investigation. Yeah. And the way you take the archival footage and footage of news accounts of the day and interject like, like these reenactments, it's, it's, uh, it's remarkable. It's like, it's so full of content and so many, there's a lot of documentaries that are just full of content. But you can get lost in it, especially this this huge these tentacles of this case, widespread government corruption, all of this, and how, but how uh, uh, how you've taken all this archival footage and stuff from the past, and then mixed it with these reenactments and everything. It's 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 so remarkable. It's 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 super quality filmmaking. I got to hand it to you guys for sure. Well, we appreciate it. I, I mean, I think that you know just to make it kind of clear where we're coming from, you know, Je- Christian was a photojournalist who worked with mainly the New York times, um, for a decade or so before this, I came from more of the fiction world, making independent films and things like that. Neither of us had done anything close to what this is. You know, we were kind of coming in as novices, um, with our own, you know, experiences, but having never done anything of this scope, subject matter, anything like that. Um, and so it was, you know, it was a wide open toolkit for us, but we kind of had to make up the rules as we went along. Um, and I think, you know, the reenactments and stuff like that really, you know, came from my desire and my experiences as a filmmaker doing fictional stuff. Mm-hmm. And it, it just seemed like a logical way, especially when you're dealing with a story from 30, 40 years ago. Most many people are dead, like I said before, and you, for better or worse, it's a movie. So we have to be able to see something. Right. And so we really wanted to lean into that and use like my friends of mine that I've worked with for years um, and come together and make, you know, another another film. Um, and we wanted to do it in a way that wouldn't feel like too darn cheesy in terms of re- re- recreations. We really wanted it to feel like you're watching watching a, a film. And what's nice about a lot of this is that we found so much archival that we were able to give it to our production designers and truly recreate these spaces and these situations like Christian was talking about where we're creating Danny's office in our own office <laughs> that we were working ahead of. Uh, and we would just kind of bounce from the archive walk over into the next room and we're in Danny's office and it's like, Oh, I think this paper is here. Actually, this thing is here. Oh, he was reading the, you know, the Washington post that day. Um, and some of it's imaginative, but, but, but most of it is really based on, on pretty hard research um, as far as these things go. Uh, so it was just, you know, part of the adventure, part of the excitement. And, you know, I'd like to think that it has something to do with what Christian was saying in terms of us being able to find, um, are empathize with, 
with Danny. And I think the whole project is really a, a matter of us kind of trying to empathize with him and see it, you know, no matter what happened to him, see what he went through. And I think that that's why this story as um, you know, you, you talk about how there's major government corruption or whatever, but there's also very odd people that are not like anybody I've ever met before in my life who Danny was talking to and some of whom we've talked to. Um, I don't mean odd in a pejorative sense, but just different than any experiences that I've had. Um, and so that, that experience of meeting those people and, and in the show, you hear their voices at the time um, is, is something that I don't think that any of the previous investigations give you an insight into of what it's like for Danny to have got, gone through a year of his life entering this world it's a hall of mirrors not everything is as it seems to be we found that out i'm sure from his writing you can tell that he found that out in many ways um and that feeling of actually going through it was what we were trying to capture and I, it, you know that's i think hopefully why it's exciting well there's a lot of documentaries that'll just give you timelines and this happened and that happened. But one thing I just wrote down when you were talking, I wrote down the word uh, empathize. There are incredible segments throughout the four episodes of you guys sitting down and talking to Danny's brother, Tony. Mm -hmm. And all these years later, you know, uh, Danny was Tony's best friend, uh, brothers, super close. And you can tell after all these years just how much uh, this still affects his daily life, you know, and it will, you know, for the rest of his life. And tell me about like what it must've been like to, or what it was like to sit down with Tony and talk about his brother and like the, like the worst day of his life, because, um, Tony championed his brother. He championed his brother on nationwide TV, talking about his brother, uh, you know, he was, he was in his corner, uh, defending his, uh, honor, just, uh, raising these questions. You know, he didn't know if his brother committed suicide, committed suicide, but he wanted to raise these questions and talk about his brother and talk about the work that he was doing and, and just trying to keep his story alive. Like sitting down with Tony, how did that go? Uh, well, let me just take a short answer. And I think Christian can give a longer answer because I feel like yeah. he's closer with Tony than I am. But, um, when this happened in 1991, August of 1991, Tony was a physician, a very well-respected physician in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, he is, uh, you know, he studied under many of the best doctors and he's been the, you know, he's, he's a major deal in, in, inside of that community. And he took on the role the burden of being the family spokesman and like you said danny's champion at that time uh, for the next year or so or a couple of years he took on that role and tried to figure out and tried to push to get investigations started into what happened to to danny and i think just find out one way or another what had happened to his brother um amid a fair amount of skepticism from the authorities um then after uh, there was an unsolved mysteries episode that came out in um, a couple of years later. And then Tony hasn't done an interview about this story since then in the decades since then. So it's not like the situation where we just call Tony up out of the blue and say, Hey, has, have you ever thought about doing a documentary series about your brother, yeah. you know, story? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it was a, a long process of, trying to even prepare ourselves, just knowing that that would be the case, prepare ourselves to um, relate to him and make him understand that we, where we were coming from, which was, I think, a sincere place of wanting to know what happened to Danny, but also tell his story and just the amount of work and research that it wasn't this fly-by-night kind of operation that we were. Um, but it was incredibly important for us to tell Tony's story, um, to hear from him because he is the most, you know, most, the closest person to Danny. And, and Christian is really who spearheaded that relationship. And maybe, maybe. Yeah. I, I, um, I met, um, Danny's mother, his late mother 
and back in 2013 and his sister. And um, I mean, all I can really say is that the Castellero family is the sweetest, kindest, most fun and generous and and pretty much the most incredible people I've ever met. And as and Danny Castellero is also like part of that family and and fits that criteria. I mean, I'm tearing up just thinking about them. I, I love them so much. They're such great people. And yeah, it was a, th- a thrill to be able, you know, when whenever I hang out with Tony, I always learn more about uh, about Danny and, and about their lives growing up. But yeah, when we were in that interview, it was two days and it was an incredible experience to be able to really just sit down and focus for hours on end on this story that had had been um, such a big part of my life and to, and to hear, you know, a firsthand account of, uh, from someone who was there, um, someone so important to Danny who was there. It's also important to point out that when Danny went to Martinsburg before Danny went to Martinsburg, like, you know, like about a few weeks before he died, he told his brother, Tony, that if an accident happens, don't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing is as, is as it seems. Um, another great, segment of it was when you were talking to Bobby Moses Nichols, who is the son of John Phillips Nichols. And he's involved, John, his father was involved with this whole operation of the the Cabazon Indian Reservation and this casino that started off as a, you know, a cigarette mart, but kind of culminated in the murder of tribal elder Fred Alvarez when he was raising questions like, like you just, um, just keep peeling back the the layers of this onion. And we're talking about, um, you know, money laundering. We're talking about drugs and, and weapons manufacturing and, and arms testing. And then uh, it's just talking to Bobby Nichols about his dad and how you kind of reveal, I'm not going to give too much away for people that are like going to binge it this weekend, but how you kind of like start uncovering how things, and it's a running theme throughout this whole thing is like, nothing is as it, as it seems. How you uh, uncover all this, uh, it's remarkable. Well, I think a lot of it was just tracing back, trying to keep it simple and tracing Danny's story, you know. Mm -hmm. And Danny's story is all from what we have is from his notes and writings, whatever is left of his notes and writings, which is thousands of pages of, at first glance, almost, you know, he writes like, and each journalist, which is nearly impossible to read, but Christian <laughs> right. it. Um, this codex. Um, and so it was as long as we kind of followed his story and it's everything that he looked into over the course of a year is kind of in, in, remarkable to us because it took us years to even be able to tell his story, which he only investigated for a year. And there's plenty of, you know, characters and all kinds of things that we just couldn't even get into. We tried to just focus it down to the core being of what we could find. And, um, and so as long as we were following that thread, I think it, it, it leads very logically into the operation that happened out in the desert that, um, that a guy named Michael Reconnoitre, I mean, just to kind of set up this story. So people aren't just floating. It's like this, the story is about in its essence, a journalist in West Virginia, Danny Castellero, who's investigating the software and he meets this source who says, I pirated the software for the Justice Department, hacked into it, put a back door into it, and I did it in this other place in, 10 years earlier in the early 80s. And so we kind of trace it to that, to that source and tell the story through Danny's eyes, but also through Michael's eyes and through Bobby Moses Nichols' eyes, who's the son of, the, of a guy who was what seems to us and from the evidence to have been some kind of intelligence operative um, who was, who had ties to organized crime and ties to a lot of kind of nonprofit grant writing um, and uh, helping underprivileged, underprivileged groups. And he had done this kind of work around the world. It's this strange stew he was involved with, from the, I don't know, what would you say, 60s, 70s, up until the 80s, um, where he had gotten involved in similar situations. And he's a he's a known as Dr. Nichols, Dr. John Philip Nichols, where those 
doctorate degrees come from is a matter of dispute. His biography is a matter of dispute. What he was really doing is a matter of dispute. But what was amazing for us was seeing it through Bobby's eyes, which is almost like childlike eyes. Uh, he was 20 at the time um, of what it's like to have your dad start this casino in the desert that turns out to be a weapons development and research operation and pos and ends in a several murders. Um, <laughs> and you're just sitting there as a 20 year old being like, you know, and your hands are in it too. He was, he was working at the casino. Bobby was too. Yeah. Um, it's, it's wild. <laughs> it's wild. Bobby, Bobby, Bobby wanted to be a part of it because he was hoping that we could tell him anything about his dad because he simply didn't know oh okay yeah well like there's a any i think he liked us i can see why i'm sure that there's like a lot of people that were interested in being a part of it just to help tell the story but also like this pursuit of truth you know and and it you know even though people have died that are are talked about in this film and a lot of time has passed we are talking about high-ranking government officials including ex-presidents, uh, the biggest news of the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, you know, how, how this can be wrapped up in a lot of that. And you're going around knocking on people's doors. You know, there's a lot of footage of you guys knocking, just doing the old gumshoe detective work, knocking on doors. How, were people, you know, how, were people still to this day a little frightened to kind of bring stuff up. Uh, there's, there's a remarkable interchange between you and a lady, I think is on episode four um, when, you know, she's talking about notes being dropped to her secretly at a bowling alley, uh, you know, and getting all this information and were people still after all this time, a little hesitant to bring up all these, uh, all these old wounds. If I could tell you how many times someone told me to be careful. Over yeah, this and that's what I'm talking years. about, man. That's crazy. But it's also like, okay, I'm being careful, but I'm also trying to figure this story out. So, you know, doing both. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, definitely. They knocked on so many doors to people that didn't want us to talk to us, didn't want to talk to us or wanted us to leave or like, you know, it was crazy. It was insane. Yeah, a lot of time has passed, but for some people whose lives we just intruded upon uh without them expecting um it would could have happened yesterday you know yeah i think there's like a what what the story is about is about a connected series of cases or or, or interconnected stories and scandals right so any one of those things has a number of landmines for people you know who, who were actually there or involved and most of these cases are unsolved officially so, you know, beyond the idea of whether Danny committed suicide or was murdered, the other cases that we go into involve unsolved homicides um, right. along the West Coast uh, in many cases um, with some very dangerous players. And if it's unsolved, there's the question of a, of a cover up or who has helped keep this under wraps, what happened with these cases. So, yeah, people are cautious and I don't blame them. Um, I think that, you know, we just tried to go with the sunlight as the best disinfectant kind of philosophy normally, while also keeping, you know, if people don't want to talk, that's none of our business to make them talk. And we understand why we just kind of keep on going because we're accumulating evidence and it's not one person or thing that kind of everything hinges on for us. And just to give the listeners a scope, if they haven't seen yet, how wide ranging this documentary is there's even a segment where now I, I did a show a while back with a, with a really, really fine um, Kennedy assassinologist, I guess you would say. And you guys have a segment on there where a lady, a, uh, a journalist is shown a clip of the, uh, of a Zapruder film that nobody else has ever seen. And you describe it in detail. And I was just like, Oh my gosh, Craig Chacon is his name. I'm like, he would love <laughs> to see that or talk to you guys, or maybe he has seen it. So, I mean, there's that. You also have like this grid that you refer to a lot, how things are interconnected between the people and the events. And I did see, I did see, I mentioned it earlier. I did see a little 
uh, a point of interest about the Franklin Credit Union scandal. And, you know, I, I'm not an investigator or researcher uh, of your dedication or caliber, you guys, like you guys are. But uh, I've tried to get people to come on the show and talk about the Franklin Credit Union uh, conspiracy and all that since it uh, happened, you know, headquartered here in Omaha. Can't. Nobody wants to. Uh, nobody wants, no, not on record. Nope. Nobody wants to talk about it. And that happened in the eighties. And one of the main guys that wrote a book about that, John DeCamp, he's dead. And so I and can't the him. investigator died in a mysterious plane crash. Um, I, I can't remember his name. Yeah. Um, with his daughter or something, right? Yeah. It was his right. son. Um, I, yeah, I, I, um, in pursuit of trying to like, could, um, help a confidential source of ours agree to go on the record um i had to show him a rough cut of the first episode and it, with 10 minutes in and this is someone who is pretty connected to a certain part of the story he started weeping mm. wow and i i i asked him you know what's wrong like and and he just through like through his tears just said so many people had to die and I was not expecting that at all. And I don't even know quite what he's talking about. Even though we did have a report, he he still kept a lot of things veiled. But yeah, this is a heavy story. Yeah. I mean, it's really easy to kind of, when you start going down these dark conspiracies and thinking about it, I mean, it's really easy to go down the road of like the U.S. government is a sham or, you know, the Federal Reserve is running secret bond black markets and global finance being controlled by rogue black op, you know, manipulators. Yeah, I, just, I mean, something it's, on the it's really easy to go through that. I'm sorry, but, but like my point was like in our time remaining, like you guys were, you make a point of like trying to jump out of the rabbit hole too and, and try and like, like get some mental sanity after doing all this. How are you doing it, on that? Trying to soberize this kind of drug of conspiracy. Yeah. I'm sorry. I cut you off, Zach. Well, I was just going to say, you know, th yes, there's a lot of very conspiratorial things in here, but for us, it was, it's not, this isn't necessarily like our theory, right? We're following mm -hmm. Danny's theory and, right. and other people that talk to Danny and we're trying to sort of separate the wheat from the chaff. And that's what Christian did a lot of. And then eventually I was doing, um, and trying to tell the story. So I just don't, I don't think that our perspective was like, here's us proselytizing about like how the world really works or something like that. It's more of us telling the story of people who say this is how the world really works. Yeah. And I think that that there's like a little gap between those two different things. That is the interesting place that we're, we're, we're interesting, interested in exploring in this show. Yeah. I, I mentioned like there's this interesting duality, not only of just telling the story, the story of Danny and, and his pursuit of truth, but also like you guys, your pursuit of that story of, of, of him, but also putting it on a human level, how it affected Danny's family and the people that he was close to and the real life, you know, ramifications on, uh, on a community and, you know, people that, that cared about him. And like you said, like this guy saw a rough cut of your first episode and it brought him to tears about how many people had to die. So there's a real human spin. It's not just, uh, you know, secrets and diabolical this and, and timelines. There's, there's just such a great human connection, a human story to it. Um, especially, you know, you know, Christian and the toll it took on you and how's your book coming? Um, I'm trying <laughs> to find a new agent or get my old one back on board. I don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I still want to do, I still want to do it. I just, I, I can't, you know, I got to get, uh, funding and stuff like that. Of course, of course. I, I took a break to work on this film for about five years. Uh, but the research is there. Hit me up, agents and publishers. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I really appreciate you guys, uh, you know, taking the time to be on my program and the work. I, I Just watching this, I could tell how passionate as a, as a filmmaker, Zach, and as an investigator, Christian, you guys were in, in telling this story. And like you said, you're not, you know, proselytizing and and telling how you think all this is playing out, but just framing just an incredible story and 
and I'm releasing it to the world for us to to investigate on our own. Like now you're now you're going to have millions of little investigators out there, like maybe even helping you, like doing some more research and looking through uh, things that haven't you know stones that haven't been turned over yet. Yeah, I mean, I would encourage people to look at it as slightly a cautionary tale of the uh, do your own research movement. You know, mm-hmm. not all fun and games for us. And that, you know, while it was an adventure and fun, uh, there's a cautionary aspect to, I think the whole, the whole endeavor. Um, so that's why I say we do it so that you don't have to, you know? Um, but yeah, maybe people will, we, we, we do hope there are a few lingering mysteries and, and I, I hope it just really triggers memories of people who were actually involved with any of the stories that we talk about who might, have some little piece of knowledge and they might say, you know what? Some time has passed. Let me tell you what I know. Yeah. We, we hope that for sure. And I'll, I'll, and Brian, I, I, I agree with you. Like, and, and I think it's cool that we showed the, the investigative process that we took, which it is a lot more than just watching a YouTube video about a, a subject. You know, we did a real investigation. We got waited sometimes years for government files, talked to real, um, government investigators and and real journalists and you know we just did did a lot of real reporting and that's what you you know that's that's what an investigation is yeah one one last thing though like the the uh, in the final episode there's that scene where you're uh, after all these years one of your foia requests came in and you're able to go through like that case box that yeah. had like somebody i i uh, whoever brought it out to you and let you examine it said, you know, I don't think anybody's opened this up in 20 years. And just the looks, the looks on your faces when you're opening it up and you're, and you're reading through these things and you're just kind of like your eyes open up, like, like with newfound, I don't know, vigor in the investigation because it, it, it like you kind of lead up to like, man, this is really taxing. This is really, you know, weighing on our souls and our psyche a lot. But like that, that FOIA request comes in, you open up that box and like your investigative juices just start flowing again and and uh yeah, gas gas on the fire yeah yeah well guys having you on the program what uh what a treat um american conspiracy the octopus murders it is uh it's already out it came out yesterday if you're listening to this on march 1st 2024 on netflix and what what a treat to have you guys on a big a lot of respect for you guys um, much love much respect uh, I really appreciate uh, your your craftsmanship, Zach, and putting all this together. And Christian, your your uh, your endeavor, this work that you uh, that you guys uh, went through to tell this incredible story. Really appreciate it, Brian. I mean, it's you know it's a collaboration between both of us, so there's a lot of overlap on on both sides of that. And Christian's aesthetics and my me looking at recent, you know, it was just a just a mess of us getting in there and getting our hands dirty. Thanks so much for having us on. Sure, thank you so much. Absolutely. And if you guys ever uh, come to Omaha to go look through dusty, dirty archives in some basement, I'll someplace. be honest, <laughs> we are interested in that, you know, the Franklin scandal. It's been a while since I was reading about it, but it's it's one of these things that somebody needs to do something on. It's incredible. Well, if you guys are walking around Omaha, I know all the good restaurants and places that you need to go. We'll hit you up. Right on. Everybody. Thanks so much. And thank you for being on this episode of Necronomics. Well, there we go, everybody. Episode 269 of Necronomicast, featuring researcher Christian Hansen and filmmaker director Zachary Trites. I want to thank them for their time. And also, I want to give a shout out to John and Allison over at Netflix, doing all the behind the scenes work necessary to make that conversation happen. All the emails back and forth, lining up people's schedules getting everything so we can have that sit down and talk about that incredible Netflix documentary and I'm excited to be working with Netflix again in the future episode 270 is coming up in two weeks my friends and that's going to be a little bit of a change of pace I'm going to be featuring the Blumberg family from the television series We Bought a Funeral Home I want to be them when I grow up great family I get all of them sitting down for a conversation all about their experiences in that haunted funeral home that you saw on television. So join me in the Blumbergs for the next episode and join me and just a cavalcade of great guests and speakers at the Nebraska International Bigfoot Conference being held in April. Two shows a month here of Necronomicast, every 1st and 15th. 
because you deserve it. That's why. A lot of surprises, a lot of fun guests coming your way as we march through 2024, the historic Haunted Heartland Conference here in Omaha in October. It's gonna be lots of fun. And I wouldn't be able to do any of this without your kind listenership and support. So with that, thank you so much. Go get some sleep. My goodness.